Hi guys, so here is a quick tutorial on uh, buffer overflow. Now this uh, tutorial is uh, way different from uh, what I usually make. I usually make tutorials on Salesforce or sometimes JavaScript or uh, specifically in Lightning, Salesforce Lightning. But uh, I thought to make some tutorials on security as well and uh, especially uh, when I before I moved to Salesforce, uh, so at the time I had a uh, lot of interest in computer security, network security, um, basically how to attack and how to gain access and uh, all these things. And then eventually I moved to uh, development and then uh, after a few years I think uh, I missed a lot. So it's time for me to again start doing something and what's the best way to actually uh, start doing something and then sharing that uh, with uh, the YouTube channel which I already have. So along the way I would be uh, telling you about uh, various methods because uh, my uh, thought process and uh, how I pick things up is completely full blown attack thing. So I would be focusing on that uh, vulnerability research that would also come along. So so many cool stuff are going to come along. So today, uh, let's pick a very old one. It's uh, actually uh, a bug, a security vulnerability which surfaced uh, towards the late 90s, and it's called buffer overflow. So here is a little uh, program which you can see here, and uh, you see that there is a fixed. Uh, length specified in the character array basically it's a C program and then uh, we declare array in this way if you have uh, worked on C you would find it uh, very familiar and uh, also in C++ we have like this we can do dynamic memory allocation actually that's a good way to avoid uh, having any fixed declaration of uh, arrays or um, maybe it could be of any container the problem is if you see the next line i'm doing a stir copy and i'm taking this value and putting that into the buffer now this value it's coming from the command line arguments now if you don't know what command line arguments is you can run a program from a command command prompt or a terminal and then you can pass instructions into that so let me quickly show you so that it makes sense those who are not aware of let's say i have a program called max right and then i hit enter if the program ex exists so it will run right let's say if i can uh, pop calc.exe so as you can see that there is a little pop-up came so if i close it so that is gone so calc.exe is a program now I can pass parameters to that also so this would be a command line argument right now this wouldn't do anything because this is a graphical user interface program so it wouldn't produce the output but you get the point I can pass arguments just after the program and then it would execute that of course in our calculator exe it's not the same case now here when we have a fixed set of uh, fixed length for the array so what the vulnerability is so when the program is loaded into the memory it takes place uh, there are many registers and so many stuff like that so what i will do is i will compile this program and then run it so there are no errors so let's go to the directory so this is the buffer overflow and then what i will do is i will launch it from a debugger so that we can see at what state and memory state and CPU state that EXA is. So what a debugger is? A debugger is uh, if you have worked with uh, setting up breakpoints uh, while doing C, C++ or uh, C Sharp or maybe Java so you can set breakpoints. So you are actually in a debugging mode. So the same way the program can be loaded into the memory using something called loader so there are many debuggers out there like immunity debugger which i'm using now because it looks cool and there are many others like ida pro 
Oli debug, by the way, Oli debug and immunity, they are very close to each other. In fact, uh, immunity is a kind of a derivation from Oli debug. So it, it's like a loader which loads the program into memory and then it can take control of the execution just like in normal debugging how it happens the same way. Okay, so what I will do is I can either attach a running process or I can open an executable and it would load the program. So let's go to the desktop. So in that let's find our tutorial, uh, the exe for the tutorial, vulnerable programs, C buffer overflow. So as I said that uh, we are accepting inputs from the command line argument. So and you will remember that the size was 10. So let's give it some random input. I think that should do it. So now I will open it. This is paused. As you can see, these are the registers. Now I will uh, get more into this. The what are the registers? How many types of registers are there? What are flags? And 64-bit registers versus 32-bit registers versus 16-bit versus 8-bit. I will try to get into as much depth as possible, as much as I have time. So. I would like to make all this information so much accessible to everyone so I highly recommend you subscribe to this channel like you have been watching my other videos so you will learn a lot because uh, this is all if you can recollect if some of you are from computer science background this is assembly language basically these are registers so we are getting into assembly language so in order to be a exploit developer or a security researcher you need to learn assembly so that's the thing without that you cannot do that that is not possible in order to know the state of the application what vulnerabilities are you have to look into its assembly code only then you can find it so let's continue with the video so here are the registers and as, as you can see our values, the supplied values, A's, all the A's, they are, we, we cannot find it, right? Why? Because the program is paused. If you can see towards the right, it says pause. So now I will run it. Boom. So now you can see is this EBP 41, 41, 41, 41. All these things are filled with the ASCII characters A's. As you can see towards here, the this is, by the way, memory, the stack, and then uh, this is the state of the registers, and this is addresses. Addresses means actually this is the memory. So these are all filled with A's. And EIP, this is a special register. EIP means extended instruction pointer. In 16-bit world, it was called instruction pointer, and it has a different name in 8-bit world as well. And in 64-bit, I guess it is called um, RIP uh, or something. We will get to that when we deal with 64-bit uh, uh, assembly. So instruction pointer is a special pointer, I would say. So it actually takes the program from a specific state. Like the program is loaded, like we are playing a VLC media player or something some app maybe iTunes so all of the functionalities in the program doesn't run at once right so one functionality runs like you clicked somewhere so something happens so behind the scene EIP is the thing which takes care of that which instruction to execute next which address space to go to next and then the next instruction get executed so in theory these are all random data, right? These are all A's. So if we could pass a specific instruction here, like go to this location, so it would happily do that. So these are, the amount of space over here is four bytes. So what we can do is, in assembly, I will uh, get to that. Uh, this is just a precursor to all the videos which are going to come. So I will teach you how to write uh, assembly programming and stuff like that. 
and how to find these vulnerabilities uh, like you do not even have to look at the source code because most of the time you wouldn't have access to the source code so you would have to find these vulnerabilities from the executable itself so at that time we will also jump into ida pro which is another disassembler come debugger also so the instruction pointer that takes care of where uh, the actual location memory location where to jump so there are many operations in assembly language so like adding to registers or maybe uh, passing a value from a place to a register or from a register to memory subtracting values so the similarly there is another operation called jump like in c program or in java we have instructions like i plus j it means addition i minus j it means subtraction so if you uh, if you have worked with uh, some of the esoteric type of looping using jump instructions like you create a label and then you have a go to statements to go to that label and then you can use go to and label for looping so similarly in assembly we have something called jump so in theory if i could have an arbitrary code in some of the location let's say after esp like this location which you see right here 0022ff50 and uh, forgive me if all this thing is bouncing off so if you have any questions put that in the comments i would happily explain that but uh, this is my first tutorial and i would like to try to cover as much as i can and forthcoming videos would have so i just want to give a blast here and then uh, do a full blown exploit here and then gradually i will expand on that so uh, let's uh, see how it goes and uh, bear with me and if you have any questions please uh, put that in the comments i will happily explain that so moving on so now these are this is the address basically 0022ff and we could have an arbitrary code and the starting point of that code could be stored here so in theory if we make a jump from eip to esp which is in now we have just a's so these are not harmful doesn't doesn't do anything so if we have our code in place of a's and if we make a jump from eip it would actually execute the arbitrary code that we provide how do you run an arbitrary code well it's simple when you can pass a is to a program input you can pass instructions as well that is called shell code how do you write a shell code well when you dig into assembly which i am going to cover so you would have many things over there the operands operands means uh, which i just explained the adding of two values stored into registers subtracting so we also have hexadecimal representation for those operands so those could be you know just collect them and then pass that as a's and those operands those instructions would be executed so the best way to explain that is to actually run an exploit so i will close off this and then I have a sample over here like uh, in this folder I have an FT FTP server now FTP server is uh, just like we have when you uh, dig into networking TCP IP there are seven layers so application layer then uh, presentation layer then session layer then transport layer then network layer then data link layer and then physical layers these comes from the osi model and then tcp ip has uh, collectively taken some of these layers like three of the first layers which i told application presentation and session so it is put into application layer and then so on so since this is a video on exploitation so i wouldn't dig too much into networking but you can take this uh, information as a starting point and then explore all the types of layers which are available what is tcp and how the communication happen between application 
So FTP means file transfer protocol. It is a protocol and that protocol is used by many programs to communicate to each other. So in our case, it's an FTP server. So if you, if you would have downloaded Mozilla Firefox, not from their website, but from their FTP server, you could actually grab the EXE from the FTP server as well. So similarly, we have a sample program here. So it means like we download Mozilla Firefox from FTP. So similarly, we can do, we can download many things and we can send data from the FTP client to that server as well. And forgive me if uh, it's getting too much of uh, theory. So let me give you an example, right? Mozilla Firefox FTP. So in our case, our browser, web browser is the FTP client. So this is the thing. So even though this is FTP uh, dot Mozilla dot com, but it is actually following HTTPS protocol, but you would be able to find something like this as well. So the URL would be something like this. So it's always redirecting. So typically the URL would be like this instead of HTTP, it would be FTP colon double slash and then something. Okay. I will close off this. Here I was trying to dig into the assembly language, the registers and so many things. We will get to that. So let's run the exploit, okay? So this is a simple program and then I have on the side is my attack machine. By the way, I am using VM. Uh, uh, the VMs are running in Oracle VirtualBox. So I can attack uh, both the, uh, I have the same VMs in the same network and I can uh, have a target machine and then uh, attack. I will also cover how to install VM and how to do the networking so that two VMs can communicate to each other and at the same time they will have access to the network as well. And then network means uh, it could be your school network, college network or even your corporate network. And when I say that, the VM has access to the internet through something called NAT, which is called network address translation. So if you shut that down, so the machine wouldn't be able to attack the local network per se, but still two VMs can communicate to each other. I will show you the configuration in forthcoming videos. I wouldn't want to cover a lot here and let's uh, focus. Let's get back. I don't know what the hell is wrong with me. I always, try to cover a lot and then uh, taken away somewhere else. So let's attack this. So as you can see uh, and uh, ignore most of the code what is what it is and this is all hexadecimal value if I put it shortly and I will explain you briefly what's going on. So and this is by the way Python language. So forget the syntax and just think of it as inputs. Okay. So this payload is the input, those A's that we pass, remember? So we can multiply any character by that many times as we want. How we got this number, that is another topic. I will cover that later. What's going on is, remember when we supplied the input, we supplied randomly A's. What if we had supplied a specific number of A's and then pass a jump a jump op code to the EIP which would land to our shell code. Let me show you that in the debugger what I mean. So this is the windows and this is now the FTP server is running so I can attach process. So this is our FTP server. So what I mean is Remember when we crashed that program? So it was all A's in ESP. If you do not remember, uh, please go back to the uh, uh, few minutes ago in this video and you would get that. And then this EIP, it has also, it had also values A's. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to push my arbitrary code, which is this one, this all over here and then pass A's, right? So A's would be there and then 
the EIP would be there which is 4 bytes by the way so it would be B's and then C's okay so let's run the program and let's see what happens right right now we are not going to exploit it we are just going to see the state of the registers and we would actually exploit it through this line okay which has our shell code so let's run this little program which will crash the FTP server okay so this is our FTP server running which is in pause state by the way so we'll run it so now the FTP server is running okay all looks good and now we are going to crash that server so look at the windows side what has happened you see right down here access violation means this EIP it has no damn idea what to go what to go next what to do next and then this ESP it is filled with C's all over the place and the interesting thing this is by the way stack stack is like when you buy a piece of RAM 4 GB 2 GB or what have you so the addressing happens from higher to lower like you are filling a container which is of a 10 liter bottle uh, through a, a water bottle and then, are, and then you are putting water so how it happens it rises from zero to the top of the bottle but in RAM it goes the other way around it's called little Indian way and by the Indian means I mean E N D I N not I N D I N there is no such thing as I N D I N in assembly language so from higher addressing towards the lower addressing okay so these are all A's as expected and this is B and then here is our shell code so what we have to do now is we have to overflow that buffer and by the buffer means there is a specific length of the array which is stored in the FTP program which is our target program so we would overflow the buffer till this point all over from the beginning till this point and then here we pass the jump instruction and then here we have our shell code okay so ESP would have our ESP also would have four bytes and then four bytes and then four bytes and then four bytes but the first four bytes would be stored in ESP so we are going to do a jump from EIP to ESP okay so I will close off this since our program has crashed it's of no value so I will try to locate that jump ESP where it is okay so I launch the program again immunity attach FTP server okay and then we run it and then we find we try to find jump ESP because ESP would have the first four bytes of our shell code all commands jump ESP so we find our shell code we can take any of the system 32 DLL it has to have jump ESP so here we, we have 72 24 F8 F7 okay so here we have 77 24 F8 F7 let me verify that again quickly F 77 24 f8 f7 77 24 f8 f7 now you would notice that I have written that in the reverse order remember I mentioned the Indian notation so the addressing would always happen from higher towards uh, lower end so the addressing here also should have to be in the reverse order so it seems our code is there our jump EIP instruction is here which we search from there and then our shell code is here 
now this shell code this is written in assembly first and then converted to hexadecimal values when you write assembly when i cover those topics i will explain that so let's run that And then let's make sure that our server is running. Okay. By the way, we do not need this anymore. So, because the target machine wouldn't be running a debugger in it, right? It would be just running the program, and that is our target. So, back to Kali Linux. So last time we had crashed it. So let's see what has happened. It's running smoothly. Doesn't look like that it is actually hacked. So now the shell code is written in a specific way that it is a shell bind shell code. So now actually it's trying to make connection to us. So we will just welcome it. Kaboom. So you see, this is a Windows command prompt. So now we have access to that. So let's check what we can do. So if I do dir, we are in FTP server.exe directory. So if I try to create a folder or install a virus, malware or anything that is possible, I can do. We are in this directory basically. So let's test that we have actually hacked that system by creating a directory hacked okay so let's go to windows and definitely we have done it so guys uh, thank you for watching and i hope you enjoyed the video and if you have questions so please put that in the comments by the way this is just a precursor to the full package that i'm going to deliver i will cover a lot C programming, assembly, how to write shell code, and how to disassemble a program, how to see the assembly source code, and how to make sense of it, how this network connectivity based shell code worked. We could pop up a calculator or anything now, but we are remotely able to control the machine. That's cool, right? That's really cool. So we are going to do so many stuff and in this video I have tried to pack as much as possible. So I would stop here and I would extend this video through so many tutorials. So I highly recommend you subscribe to this channel and you will learn a lot. I have known many people in security industry. So even for everyone, there are uh, specific domains in uh, security that everyone, it is not possible for everyone to cover every domain. Like this is buffer overflow. This is system hacking, basically. So this is a part of uh, one of the various modules of a good course called uh, CEH, Certified Ethical Hacker. So I'm not a, a kind of promoting uh, that certification, but if you want to check that, I highly recommend you do that. So I am just specializing on one of those modules. So there are many. This is system hacking. So there are many. And there are also like malware analysis and so many other stuff which I'm going to cover. So I will try to focus on complete offensive security, complete attack, because that's how I started. So I would like to stick to that. But you can use the same knowledge to defend yourself and also where you work and uh, the project which you work or your client or it could be anyone. Okay. So uh, thank you for watching again, guys.